The first thing that attracted me about participating here was the forward-looking nature. Uh, I know we need to go back, but if we spend a lot of time on what went wrong, we will become more displaced. Then once I started preparing, I, I regretted agreeing because there were two ways I could have responded to this. I could have sent you a WhatsApp. <laughs> and this is what my WhatsApp would have said about the future I want and the future I deserve. First, I would have said it's a state in which governance is a virtue. And the primary virtue of a government is protection and security. It doesn't matter whether you are in a rural, what, in a communist state, in whatever, the minimum, I'm not saying the only function, the minimum function of a state is to, to guarantee my safety. Otherwise, I'll do it myself. It's as easy as that. The second country I want to live in is the country in which ideally all, but practically majority of people have a vested interest in its survival, in its prosperity. If your citizens don't care whether you will still be there tomorrow, there's something you are doing wrong. And the third part of the state where I want to live is the state where we understand that where injustice persists, peace cannot exist. I could have said that in a WhatsApp, you agree, right? <laughs> the other extreme is what I call the laundry list approach. <laughs> but that one would require the whole day. Where every virtue I'm looking for, I name. For example, my aspiration might be that to live in a state where every citizen can afford a private jet. You know, I can go through that whole list. So what I've decided to do, given the time where we are, was avoid the safety, I mean, avoid the laundry list approach. That one is a catalog of dreams and aspirations, and we all have them, and you don't need any research to do that. I decided just develop a short, simple storyline. And that storyline, in my case, will focus on what is it that we should get right even before we try to do other things. That's what I'm hoping to do. And provide a simple GPS to say if that's what we identify, let's go this route. So the presentation is divided in three parts. The first part is the most recent elections. I think there are important lessons to learn from that. The second part is to do what I said I wouldn't have come if that's where, what we are all coming to do, is to go back to the 80s and say what are key lessons we can learn from the 80s to deal with the present situation. In other words, use the rear mirror just to make sure that you can reach your destination. That's all. You can't drive on a freeway in reverse gear and, and, and not avoid, expect to cause trouble. And the last part will be restatement of those three aspirations. Let us start with the good news. We had, we had successful elections, non-violent and substantially free and fair. When I say substantially free and fair, I'm suggesting that even if you go back and identify some mistakes, and there should be many errors that have happened, it would not change substantially the outcome of the election. We need to celebrate that. The second thing we need to celebrate is that the electorate sent a clear, unmistakable message, uncomfortable message. And that message was to all parties, 
we don't trust you to run the country on your own. And unmistakable. You see, people debate whether the government should have gone into a GNU and whatever. Don't blame or praise any of the parties for going into the GNU. That was the decision of the electorate, not their decision. And they had no choice whether they liked it or not, they had to do it. I think that's important. And that means we are coming to the third good news is we are coming to the end of a single dominant party. Whether it's party or private sector, a single dominant actor eventually becomes arrogant. And we need a, a clear message that the time is over for that. The other thing which is good, in particular to the ruling party, we have come to the end of the reward of the liberation dividend. People are saying, thanks very much, you have done a great job. Now, from now on, we will hold you accountable for delivery. We won't reward you for history, we will hold you accountable for, de for delivery. We underestimate this, but if the message goes through, we are going to get a different kind of political mentality within political parties. And that I don't think it's the wrong thing. The other good news, the majority party accepted defeat without even arguing about it. You see, we forget that Donald Trump is still refusing to <clears throat> recognize his defeat in the last elections. So this is something to celebrate and we need to commend the ruling party for that. Some people say, well, you can't thank a fish for swimming. Quite true. But the reality we know on our continent, no liberation movement has ever given power. And if you don't know that, ask why are there so many Zimbabweans in South Africa? I think we need to celebrate that. But within these blessings and so on, there are things we should feel uneasy about. If no single political party is trusted, it means our entire electoral and political party system is under review. It is very dangerous. It means people are alienated for an important, very, very important political institution. And something we forget, it's not only the ANC that lost votes, the DA did not gain it. So it means your two major parties are under suspect from the electorate. None of them should begin to tell the others your side of the boat is leaking. Both are sinking if they are not careful. <laughs> the third thing we should worry about, and it confirms the previous one I made, if 40% of eligible voters did not vote, what were they doing? What are they planning? Don't assume they've gone to sleep. They must be planning something sinister. We should worry about that. So a political system in the whole, as a whole, was rejected by 40% of electoral qualified electorate. That should worry us. Why should it worry us? First, because it shouldn't. First, because it's telling us people have lost ownership of the country. But most important is that people see a political vacuum. And that vacuum, none of the parties can fill, according to voters. And let me tell you, people who are always ready to fill any vacuum, it's organized criminals. Those never allow vacuums to develop anywhere. They will fill them. So it is very, very important that we get the political system right again. So that's the end of the first part. I said I will talk about the now. Let's look back. Let's take the mirror to see what can we learn from the 80s. 
I don't want to go way beyond that. Very, very interesting parallels. Those who are my age will remember that in the late 80s, the National Party was punch drunk. He did not know whether P.W. Vota had a double strategy. He actually pushed reforms quite a lot in that period. But he also bludgeoned many people. <laughs> it was a carrot and stick approach that he had. Going 10 steps this way, coming back, going 15 steps that way. That was interested. That was interesting. There was confusion. If you look at South Africa today, and in the past five years, it was on autopilot. There was no government. I challenge you, anyone, to tell me where was the government taking us to? And we saw the consequences of that. Governments not being able to rule. That was 1980, particularly towards the end. The second thing that was interesting in both cases, then and now, is that our economy was in a casualty ward. In both cases. The second thing, the third thing in both cases, the country became ungovernable. The governments were becoming weaker and weaker. And if you think we were governable, I'm sure everybody here remember the events of July two or three years ago. The country was in a mess. Criminals had taken it over. And who was missing in action? The security class. They were nowhere to be seen. And what was interesting, all of them kept their jobs even afterwards. In any serious country, they would have all been fired. They kept their jobs. 1980-89, we were on the brink of civil war. I think so. Later on, I might say, well, maybe we were not. But you mentioned we were tired. There was no way. The government was lost. The National Party was lost. And we were on the brink of civil war. And we didn't. And I'll come back to that. What was the result of all of that? We went into Cordesa. From Cordesa, we went into the government of national unity. That's what I'm saying. Not government of national unity is nothing new here. But something quite worrying also happened. It was followed by the death of the National Party. Are we about to see the death of the ANC coming out of this? We need to ask those questions. I'm just running through my storyline rashly and quickly. I'm sure there will be a question time where I have to live. But I want to go back to what got us from that mess in 89 into Cordesa. Mm -hmm. One, effective poli and decisive political leadership on all fronts. That leadership read the signs of the times. We didn't know then, and that's why I said I'll come back to the question of leadership. I mean, of a civil war. I think top people in the ANC and the National Party knew that the civil war was not on the horizon. <laughs> why? Because they were already talking to each other going back to 1985. While we were burning down, they were talking. They read the signs of the time. And they realized we have to talk, we are getting nowhere. One of the things that worries me, so they knew there was no civil war. That leadership was critical. I can't answer today, 
But the DA and the ANC seems to have been caught off their pants by the results. Otherwise, unless they were talking two years ago without telling us. But we don't get a sense they even anticipated what was coming. What else is important? There was active civil society. You know, you mentioned a lot about people. You cannot have democracy with paralyzed people. The two don't work together. Active civil society, and when we talk about that, people think immediately UDF, labor movement, and so on. But there was another group, a group of Africaners who began to go and talk to the ANC quite illegally. I remember on one of their trips back home, they had to, when they came at the airport, they had to be brought out by, by the back door. P.W. Bota was paying for their blood and the A.W.B. was waiting for them with black paint. They were going to be painted black. They were courageous people. And the point of the matter is what we need to remember about governments. Governments never lead. They follow the greatest pressure. <laughs> no government leads especially in a democracy. In a dictatorship, a leader can decide this is where we are going. In a democracy, governments follow the noisiest. <laughs> and civil society in this country has been silent. And that's why we have this mess. The time has come to talk. What kind, how do we get to where we want to. I gave you three things. I want to narrow them a bit. For me, there were two things that would make me happy today. To, to. If, and both of them are achievable. The first one is, if safety is paramount. Now you would think, following what I said, that's the role of government. It's actually your role and mine, and I'll tell you why. You cannot be safe if part of the key players in your government are criminals, you can't, you cannot be. So as citizens, we need to be very clear about who are the people we trust in the safety and security class. That, that's very, very key. If it's run by criminals or if government overall is run by criminals, forget about your safety and security. And, and security. Number two that I think is achievable we need. Before we have bigger dreams, I said I'll take two. Can we live in a country where we are absolutely sure no single citizen goes hungry? Is that a big ask? I think we can achieve that in six months. It's not a big ask. Forget, poverty is not a reality, it's a political creation. And we can uncreate it. And I didn't say, let us remove poverty. That requires greater strength. But we can make sure within six months that no South African goes to bed hungry. I'm saying for me, for now, those are my two big dreams. I want to be healthy, and I want to make sure every South African eats. And I talked about the vested interest. I will finish this section with a few points about the GPS. How practically do, what do we need? What are the conditions of possibility for us to get there? One is an effective and ethical government. As I've said, safety is impossible where your cluster in security is either incompetent, ineffective, or corrupt. Two, regardless of your political affiliations, support the GNU. That's all we have, whether you like it or not. If you don't like it, I don't know who you're going to support. If they fall, they fall with us. They are going to take us. Let us give them a chance. Let us do. And one of the things I forgot to mention amongst our graces, some governments can take up, not can, do actually take up to two years to form a GNU. 
We formed the GNU at record time. It's something that we need to be proud of. So, and here, we don't talk about, to get these two things, we need effective local government. You see, particularly the majority party has used local government as a dumping ground for field, for casualties from their parties. Our best brains, ironically, should be in local government, not in, in, not in a GNU, although we need them there. But the bulk of activities of delivery of everything is at local government. We need to jack that one up because it doesn't matter how big the dreams are. If local government cannot deliver them, you are in serious trouble. Number four, we need to begin to address alienation of key people in the country. You know, I spent a lot of time in Western Cape. I've got lots of friends there. I know the Cape Flats. And everywhere I go, people say, listen, you guys, under apartheid, we were not sufficiently black. <laughs> under you guys, we guys, they tell me, we are not black. We fit in nowhere. Whether it is right or wrong, it's a dangerous sentiment for anybody to hold. If you feel excluded, you kick the door. It's normal. The second group is interesting. None of you is carrying X to throw at my face. The collapse of the National Party was a disaster for the country. It was a disaster. For the simple reason that when the National Party collapsed or died, a very, very significant part of our population was in the dark, unorganized. Some joined the DA, others joined the ANC. And I'm sure the others began to say, well, let us fall, begin to form parliament, paramilitaries just in case. That's what I mean to say. It was dangerous for the country, not because I loved it, not because it has done anything for me, but it could do something to you. And I suspect that is already happening when you look at instability. Young people are alienated. Unemployed young people are a very, very, they are a moral issue, but they are a serious security risk. Women, the poor, the unemployed, even clever blacks are complaining that we are not allowed to play any space in government. What I'm saying is, if you have such a major constituencies of your society, alienated from your society, instability, is what you are quoting. And we need to look at that together. And for me, it's a polite way of saying, Codessa achieved many things. The first 10 to 15 years after 1994, we were going north on every important indicator. But the only thing we failed as a country we never sat down and say, now, how do we create a South Africa? We didn't do that. We just hoped it would come by chance. It didn't. It just, what we have is a cluster of disgruntled, but powerful people, sufficiently powerful to disrupt the country. And now the good news. This is the last point I'm making. <laughs> I didn't say finally. Usually when people say finally, they say finally I've remembered what you have asked me to talk about. <laughs> so for me, the critical time where you and I come in, we should be the constructors, the creators of a united South Africa. Don't leave it to politicians. Political parties are divisive by nature. Political parties have brands. Like business people, you can't ask, pick and pay, and check us.
to form a business of national unity. No, no. <laughs> they want to be separate. They want to be seen as separate. They want to run their shows. And political parties will always emphasize what is different about them, why they are better than anybody. And I think national unity in this country will not come unless ordinary society takes it as one of their primary duties. And that is why I believe that the call for national dialogue, it's not just a call for talking and talking and talking again. It is a call for doing what is critical. Can we sit down and talk together about the South Africa we are all going to be proud of? What we should do, we should do what Rasi Erasmus did. He took a very divisive sport, rugby, and built into one sport about which you are all pride and which we support. Can we do the same about the country? Thanks, Jay.